what does the global landscape look like when we look at this set of infrastructure as well as the dynamics that you described to us earlier about how tech and spycraft are intersecting? What does the global landscape look like? Of course, you mentioned the NSA and, and Snowden. Of course, the U.S., even through its big tech firm, seems to be the, uh, the leading country. And Europe and India and other places like countries like that seem to be lagging in terms of having their own cloud infrastructure players, etc. But then there's, of course, China. But talk to us about that global landscape. Which countries do you see as having what strengths and which countries maybe as having certain weaknesses or gaps? Well, it depends which dimension of this we look at. And you raised the issue of cable. So let's maybe start with the issue of cables, right? Um, this is a fascinating domain, uh, which is becoming very, very geopolitical. So there are, there are broadly three big companies that dominate the cable laying market, right? The, the market to lay undersea cables. You have uh, Japan, the NEC Corporation. You have uh, America's Subcom. And you have France, the Alcatel submarine networks. And those three companies are very dominant. So in that sense, the West, if you will, by which I mean America and its allies and its partners, which, you know, in various ways, those are still dominant players. However, what you are seeing, if you look more closely at Asia, is that as in so many other areas, whether that's telecommunications or cloud computing, China, thanks to sustained and focused state investment, has risen up very dramatically. And HMN, which, of course, I think was a, originally had uh, was, was a, a Huawei linked firm, right? And changed yeah. its name. HMN. Um, it's it's still, Huawei it's, Marine Networks. Correct. Now it Huawei is. Marine Networks. It's still, it's, it, 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 it's still small compared to those three, but it has been laying considerably more cables in the Asia Pacific region, right? And that has prompted a kind of, um, in fact, I think if I'm just looking it up this figure now, it's laid about 94,000 kilometers of cables. Um, uh, um, across across the region, which is which is an incredible amount. And if you look at the time, roughly between 2010 and 2023, there were about 140 cables laid in Asia and about 77 in Europe. So Asia became much more important to this. And what you're seeing is a sustained American effort to try and block out those Chinese firms. And some of that is in in concert with Australia. So 2017, uh, China tries to build a cable that's between Australia and the Solomon Islands. And the concern is that by building this cable, China will be in a uh, um, superior, more advantageous position either to cut the cable in wartime or to be able to tap the cable, whether whether to collect data or to conduct traffic analysis. You know, even if it can't read the data on the cable, it could still work out who is communicating when, uh, what the patterns of communication are, and it could glean valuable intelligence. So the Americans then, the Australians then said, actually, uh, we're going to step in and provide an alternative project. And I think it was Nokia that provided the alternative project. And you're seeing this again and again in the Pacific, you know, in Palau, East Micronesia, all across the South Pacific, the Americans, the Australians and others are racing to counter ch Chinese cable laying projects. Um, yeah. But it's not just cable laying, it's also cable repair ships. And again, this is a pretty small fleet of ships in the world. Um, China still has considerable influence over it. And um, this is because fundamentally states have not invested in these very unsexy um, technologies and they find themselves now in positions of considerable dependence. Yeah, yeah. Um, another layer that I want to talk about, I think the subsea cables, again, to me is also fascinating. There's, there's all this history that I think even when I was doing the research for my own book, I came across, right, the pre-World War I era where the telegraph cables at the time, much like the subsea cables today, uh, became very, very much a, a tool of geopolitical action and military action right before World War I. Um, and so it's not a surprise if you've read that history yeah, yeah. that, you know, a, a similar thing is playing out with, with subsea cables today. Um, no. Let's talk about... There's a, there's, a good, there's a good book, by the way, um, uh, by Robert Hannigan, who's a former director of GCHQ, which is the UK Signals Intelligence Service. And he, it's called Counterintelligence. And the book is really about the importance of lateral thinking, neurodiversity uh, in, in, in intelligence, the intelligence world and what spies can teach the rest of the world about different ways of thinking. But the, some of the early chapters are very good on uh, the importance of cables to that pre-First World War world and um, the kind of individuals 
who uh, built those cable networks and exploited them in places like the Persian Gulf, where those were key nodes for the British Empire at the time. So if anyone's interested in the issue, I, I recommend that book.